Distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode 390. My name is Brando. Uh, welcome today, Mr. Do we call you Mr. Corey? Should we keep you a little bit? Go for it mysterious because we're talking about some illegal activity well we'll we'll, we'll get into that so just Corey, or how do you want to introduce yourself Corey, the fan from from jersey or or from cali where are you at now right we had a whole conversation uh jersey from jersey living here now uh just happened to be out in california uh in 2016 where in california uh bounced around started in santa monica crashed with a couple buddies from college um you know, I didn't want to uh, didn't want to squat there, so I found a spot uh, in West Hollywood. Uh, from there, Culver City, and that's where I settled for two years. Okay, cool. And and the reason why is Corey and I were becoming fast friends before the the podcast. Oh, where do you live on Long Island? Oh, I have family from Queens. So office. easy. Uh, well, that's a good segue. It's so easy. The first song that you heard when uh, Guns N' Roses hit the stage at the Troubadour. Uh, April 1st, 2016. So it was suggested to me, and I want to give them credit, all cautions on on Twitter. And for the longest time, that was the Twitter account that would track to see when Hard School was finally played live, and which was not a play at the Troubadour. It was played at the Baltimore, which I happened to. I never go to Baltimore, but I don't know. I was following GNR a little bit uh, a couple years ago. Uh, anyway, they go, why? He uh, suggested to me, he put a link to, to Reddit. Now, I have a Reddit account. I'm not on it often. I, it's so much, man. I get sucked into social media and, and just the podcast itself. If I want to have any sort of a successful marriage and, and hopefully be a good father soon, I can't have all, I, I guess Reddit, I can't do the deep dives. But I occasionally look, there's some really cool posts on there and but this one escaped me until I, I, I read it. And I was like, okay. He's like, you should get this person on the podcast. I think it'd be great for an interview. Okay. And I, and I encourage that from listeners. Absolutely. My listeners help. They make this show. They're my producers. And then I keep seeing likes from other of my followers who, who saw that because I liked it first. And it's like, okay, this is kind of gaining steam because I hadn't read it yet. I'm like, I'll, I'll read it because I was working at the time. It just seems interesting. Then I read it. And it's just simply titled, uh, I have it up here, uh, I snuck into Guns N' Roses' first show back with Slash at the Troubadour on April 1st, 2016. Now, just the title alone got me excited. So once I just saw people were like, oh, well, yeah, you should get this guy on the phone, Corey. I'm like, let me see if I can reach out. I haven't done a Guns N' Roses fan episode. I call him a fan obsession. Maybe I'll throw in a, a soundbite later after I'm, well, we're, we're finished recording. But the Guns N' Roses fan is what makes the band. They're part of the chaos. So I, I just also want to acknowledge, before, uh, I posted this on Facebook once you agreed, and I appreciate it. You're just a guy. You know, you don't, I, you don't have to expose uh, other than your travels, I guess, which I exposed already. But what you do for a living, you're just a, a normal dude. You never uh, know. I, yeah, you never know. And I guess that kind of goes into it. Sneaking into a concert, I have to put on my my soon to be father hat here or my older brother hat. You know, I have three younger brothers. Don't do that. Kids don't pay for your ticket to the honest thing. Cause there were some people that were like, why do you have this fan on the show? You know, it's, you're looking, you're making guns and roses fans look bad by recounting this guy's story of breaking in and doing something you shouldn't have been doing. But my first thought is, isn't that guns and roses? Isn't that what they, they all have done that. In all their biographies, they, so, I mean, and, and worse. So that being said, you, you, you snuck into a $10 show, but the utmost important, like 10 to, uh, $10 show in like, I don't even know, I don't know, decades or whatever. So take us through 
what you started off by saying the best story of my life involves Guns N' Roses. Take us through that day and your story. So kind of like an audible version of your, of your Reddit story, if you will. Yeah, sure. First off, thanks for having me on. This is, uh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, it's cool to recount. Um, so yeah, I'll take you through the whole day. Um, you know, it's funny because I'd listened to Guns, I'd never listened to GNR growing up and maybe a couple of years prior, uh, buddy introduced me to them. And, you know, so I listened and um, I woke up that day, it was April 1st, and I got a text from a buddy on the East Coast, you know, 6 a.m. Uh, West time. And he says, Guns N' Roses is going to be playing at the Troubadour tonight. And it's funny because before this, I knew they were playing at Coachella. I really wanted to go. Tickets were really expensive. And I said, hey, you know what? It's, it's fine. And I accepted that I would not go. Uh, he texts me that they're playing at the Troubadour. And the first thing that went through my mind is, how can we get tickets? There's probably no way. And I did. I looked online. I saw tickets for $10. But, you know, you pretty much had to be online before it was announced. Had I gotten there midnight the night before, waited online, maybe you get a ticket. But that was out of the question, right? So um, I consider myself a little bit of a sneaking artist. Um, it's not the first thing I've gotten into. Um, like how old of a guy are you, by the way? You look th th uh, I celebrated my 33rd birthday yesterday. Oh, well, happy yeah. birthday. Okay, Thank you. cool. Yeah. So I, I was going to ask, do you have a history of sneaking into movies, like your first R-rated movie? <laughs> you know, no. A girl's no. locker room, God forbid? No, no, okay, no, okay. No. <laughs> no, nothing like that. No, but, Porky's, um, uh, no Porky's references here. You know, right afterwards, uh, I have a couple. I could, I could share with you after. Um, I got onto the floor of the NBA Finals in 2016 also. Um, oh, wow. Okay. I got backstage with Snoop Dogg at a concert. This is all Los Angeles. I don't know what I had found. Los Angeles security compared to New York, East Coast, at least New York security, is like two totally different animals. I couldn't believe just kind of the lackadaisical. Security is only as strong as your weakest link. And, you know, that's kind of what this story is about as well. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, just. Uh, I mean, because you've had an eye for it before because it wasn't your first time. Because when I go to a show, I see security. You know, if I'm going to like when I saw Cypress Hill, actually, I wasn't smoking weed back then. But I mean, that's what they check for. You know, do I have anything on me? Uh <laughs> it might be that to have a joint on me just the friend i'm with have a joint on me but that's about it or they were like when i went to go see danzig uh this was the case the same thing with the troubadour we weren't allowed to take photos we had to put it into this i don't know this uh thing that it would kind of snap together to go to encase the phone yeah 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 that's so what it was at this show as well so but that's that's a relatively new thing. But growing up, I don't know, other than being, I don't know, I guess I wouldn't have noticed that. But I guess you having the Jersey part in you and the California, you kind of notice these things of like, mm -hmm. you know, these guys yeah. aren't as, these aren't East Coast guys. It's, <laughs> it's just a little bit more laid back and, uh, you know, you, you see an opportunity to take, it, you know. But um, yeah, so, you know, just uh, that day, woke up, they're going to be playing. So how do I, the first thing is, can I sneak in? Um, that was the first thing I thought and I knew it wouldn't be easy. And I drive over. So I drive over to the venue. This is around two 30 doors open to 10. Um, I did a uh, stage crew in college. So, you know, I knew that eight hours before that'll be right. That'll be before the chaos kind of ensues. And if I'm going to sneak in, it's gotta be early. So I drive by the venue and the first thing I, the first thing I see is, okay, you know, if I'm going to be a crew member, what, um, What's going on here? And I noticed, and I think it was because it was such a quick uh, show. It got announced and it's happening like that day, pretty much. So the crew, they were only wearing all black. It was obvious that they were instructed, just please wear all black. So I said, okay. Um, so uh, that was step one. Step two, how do I get in? And I only lived with this guy for a couple months, but uh, when I was living in West Hollywood, this guy who I was living with, just some random apartment, um, absolute stage five hoarder, looking back on it. Uh, I described it in the article as one of those one path through the apartment 
kind of hoarders, you know? And uh, I said, okay, I have everything I could possibly need at my disposal to sneak in. What, uh, how are we doing this? And I just came up with the idea that I knew he had sandbags. Um, the reason why that's significant is because you sometimes need sandbags to keep this big sound monitors in place. Um, so I knew this is going to be a big show. If anyone asked me, hey, look, we need more sandbags. Uh, you know, <laughs> we don't want these things falling on people. I'm just doing my job here. So I, um, I had the idea to just overload myself with sandbags. And if I'm walking in with all of these sandbags on me, is someone really going to stop me and say, excuse me, sir, what are you doing here? If I did, I would just look at them and I would just not even say a word. Are you kidding me? You're stopping me. You see what I'm doing right now? And uh, so I kind of knew no one was going to say anything. So anyway, I park in the back and, oh man, there was a, a snake uh, sandbag. There were, they were actually monitor sandbags where there's two sandbags uh, on the side and a space in the middle to keep something down. So anyway, everything I had, I put as much as I could fit on myself. You see these two young people at the back. It was a guy and a, a girl and eight hours before the show and uh, overloaded myself dressed in black shirt, black pants, black converses. This is at around 4.30 and um, walked right through. Now, if you're familiar with the Troubadour, I'm not sure how many people on this podcast are. In the back, it's kind of a bunch of, what I remember, a bunch of buildings. There's kind of a way you have to walk to to get to backstage. And so I walked through, but now I'm walking with confidence, just grumpy faced, I described it as the, with the energy of the poor intern, you know, um, well said. I can't believe someone's making me put these sandbags on and I can't believe I have to do this. And that was the, that's what I put myself in that mind frame. So anyway, I get through, they don't say anything. I'm walking through and I don't know where I'm going. There is probably, you know, a couple hundred feet. I had to make a couple turns and I just, you know, Okay, we're in. You are now stage crew. Follow the sounds. And sounds got louder, and it led me right to the stage and um, walked right through, right in. There's the stage. And the cool thing about this podcast, you'll get even uh, more of more stories than I put in the Reddit post. I excluded some things that, you know, didn't really matter. But actually, so I go in, I'm in this venue. Now, in the front, of the troubadour if you go in through the front door to the left there's a bar um so i kind of i'm just walking and i'm figuring out what to do and so i take these sandbags i just put them down in between two of those like square tables low tops for like two people that you see at restaurants they were pushed off to the side and I just put them right there and if someone wants to take them they'll take them uh, i don't know who would so i see there's a bathroom by the bar and i say okay i'll sneak in the bathroom and i go in this is just a one, it's, it's one of those ba public bathrooms where it's one toilet, that's it. It's your own private room. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, this isn't going to work. You know what, for six hours, something, you know, there's no way. So I said, I needed to devise another plan. I said, is there another bathroom in here? So I'm walking around all black, you know, I'm walking with confidence, walking with a purpose. And uh, I see that there's a men's bathroom. I said, all right. Now this flashed back, I heard this story one time. It was this kid who snuck into a festival by sitting in a porta potty for like overnight. Um, I, 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 I wish I could credit it. I don't remember who it was. It was no one I know, but I said, okay, I could do that. Where else am I gonna hide? So, okay, I'll sit in the stall. I walk into the bathroom and there is one bathroom stall in the men's room. And I said, you know, if anyone has to poop in six <laughs> hours, you know, uh, they're going to know that someone's still in there and hasn't gotten out yet. So, okay, until uh, someone has to poop, this is my home. So I'm sitting there and um, it's probably 430, maybe five o'clock now at this point. I know, uh, you know, that goes, uh, the doors open at 10. I got to hide for five, five and a half hours. And, uh, and I wait. Now, this is when it settled in that, okay, I'm in. This is now my home for the next couple hours. Now what? 
And I realized that I made no preparations for this. I didn't have anything to entertain myself. I was hungry. I, my phone, I didn't charge my phone that, before man. doing this. And my phone's at 10%. So I said, okay, turn the phone off. And, uh, and I waited. And that was the first time that I had felt raw boredom. In the days, of, you know, today we have technology, we have everything we really need at our fingertips, but I was in a position where I had to sit and wait. And that was, um, at that point, that was what I do. And I rearranged my wallet. I, I condensed <laughs> my keychain, um, you know, and, uh, and I just sit and someone would come in and my heart would drop. Please don't poop. Please don't. I, I'm just looking at the feet underneath, you know, for, um, you know, underneath these urinals, please don't walk toward me. And someone would go to the urinal. Okay. And, uh, and that was it. And my heart would sink. And there's a couple, you know, throughout the course of these six hours, um, I turned my phone off, but I would turn it on at what I would think is the top of the hour to check the time. So I did this. And at the second hour, I turn on my phone and my phone falls in the toilet. <laughs> I can't believe this, you know, and now I got to leave my quarters, go and turn the phone off, put it underneath the, the air dryer, which is right by the door of the restroom. No one knows I'm in here. Um, dried it out, put it in my pocket didn't turn it on for another couple hours. That was one story. Um, luckily, it was after that I had turned the phone on. Um, oh, I think it was, I think I had to turn the phone on because I heard the sound check and I'm hearing Axel's voice. Um, if you look at the post, I posted this video to YouTube and I uh, heard the sound check and that was the first time I turned my phone on and that was really cool. Uh, what's funny, if you look in the video, I kind of drum, I'm drumming along to, uh, I think it was It's So Eat, uh, no, Liver Let Die. And you could see one of the keychains that I, it, what I have in my hand is the, the um, coils of a keychain that, uh, a ring holder that I just, out of boredom, like unraveled and was just <laughs> messing with. So that happened. Um, so that happened. <laughs> yeah. This was, this was in, from inside the stall. This is from inside the stall. Uh, <laughs> hearing this sound check, I, I got, you know, I'm getting goosebumps listening to it. And I say, holy, sh you know, this is happening. Um, at one point, uh, at, at one point, you know, there was a couple expletives thrown at two people that were in uh, the bathroom. And I'm just pleased. All I'm thinking is, please don't poop. That is my only concern. Just please don't poop. So I'll skip forward to, you know, 10 o'clock and uh, comes around well, and I slow. Well, before the show, because this is a lot to unwrap here. Yes. Because I, I I got the level of fear about the poop in general. I mean, it's a, you were in the perfect position, though, with a stressful stomach. At least if you had to go, you were right there. You had that one thing covered that if you had to go to the bathroom, you're just you're there already. But yes, that is true. <laughs> But even like when you decided to just first do this, was there any, because it, it's, again, it's not a major crime. I would think that you would just get thrown out and nothing would happen. When was I, that your when, mindset? Yes. Whenever I um, think about doing something illegal, this is making me sound much worse than I am. But I think <laughs> what's, what's the worst thing that can happen? And you know, if I get caught sneaking in, hey, you're not stage crew. Sh does someone really want to go through calling the cops, getting me out? You know, if God bless them, but people have their own lives. People are busy. And I'm not, you know, who doesn't have a little bit of respect for someone that takes that initiative? You know, and I just, all things considered, all variables, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Okay. So, so there was, was my it, a fearlessness going into it. But it, it was the fear was building up when you were in that stall trying to find a place to chill out. And I still can't believe the not checking your phone for the for battery life. That's that should have been like because I was thinking the whole time, just beginning, like it's like Ocean's Eleven or I guess Ocean's One in this case. It's you were so calculated about the kind of sandbags and what would I would say and the look. 
you know, that I'm going to have. And you just forgot the battery. It's it's almost like a movie. It's like, you know, yeah, I, forgot. Thing I forgot, but. You know, I forgot the it, 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 it was not an important detail to get me into this. I didn't need I needed a phone for concert video, but that was not my uh, where my head was. My head was, how do I do this? What mentality does this require? And uh, the important details were met. What you was know? the uh, which we're going to we're getting into now? What was the the goal just to see the show? Yeah, the or just to be like to say, hey, hey, I was here. In addition, because I would have done the same thing. Look where I am. After a certain amount of time, because you've waited, I don't know, five years to tell this story. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I yeah, you know, I never, I never did it years. for the attention. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, that's why I, I, the only reason I posted this story to Reddit is I am of the belief that you're going to remember fewer things in life than you realize. And this is my favorite story. This is my favorite story of my life. And <laughs> I just said, you know what? I, I'm going to write this down. Uh, someone at a later point in the story recommended that I put this on Reddit that night. And uh, I'll get to that part. And I was just like, okay, you know, I will. But I didn't do it for attention. Uh, I did it to answer your question because this is a effing bad ass concert to be at. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Guns, Slash is coming back. I read Slash's autobiography and I knew that this concert would never happen. Anyone who's in Guns N' Roses, anyone who's a fan of Guns N' Roses from any point in history up until 2015 knew there was no way Slash and Axel would be together. And I understood the significance and um, I, it was right. I just happened to be living in West Hollywood. This is happening three miles away. I gotta give it a shot. And <laughs> I just knew that if I got into this concert, a small venue with a big band, for, first of all, that is my favorite kind of concert to begin with. Um, sure. So Wu-Tang Clan at the Starland Ballroom, which oh, cool. is a small venue in uh, Sayreville, New, I believe it's Sayreville, New Jersey. That's where I saw uh, Velvet Revolver. One of my favorite shows ever was Velvet How Revolver. How cool is that venue? Small, intimate. Yeah, that's why know? it was memorable. I'm telling you, and it's uh, it just had such a raw um, uh, feel to it. So that was why I went. And also, uh, part of it was that Guns N' Roses was my buddy's favorite band. Uh, and, you know, a little bit of a uh, ha-ha, look where I am. He had wanted to be with you? Did he, no, did he, he, was living in, he was living in New Jersey at the time. I okay. texted him. I said, hey, here's what I'm doing. I remember texting, I think this has about a 20 to 25% chance of working. That's what I texted him on the way over. That's what I calculated these odds at, right? And uh, <laughs> But I would say 80% because I wanted to be at this concert. You know, it's, uh, that was why I did it. And again, the, um, the consequence for getting caught, just, you know, well, you want to arrest me? I, don't know. I just didn't think an arrest was in. Was no. In. Because it's you were just a fan, and, and it's I'm just a fan are, trying to get in. You understand, you know, you know, people understand I, why I do because there are still a lot of crazy out there because there are crazy fans who do legitimate crazy things. This is not that situation. This is, you know, Detroit Rock City. This is dude, where's my car? I kind of feel like this is one sorry. It's kind of like gives me that kind of uh vibe to it. I believe the the poster when they, they came out for the troubadour. You know, it really did happen that quickly. It was because, like, is this going to be a uh, an April Fool's joke? But it was sometime after 11 p.m. So, again, you were in there for hours and hours, mm -hmm. and you would occasionally hear people coming to the bathroom. But when did you feel like it was okay to go out? And did you were just like, do, 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 this took the longest shit of my life and just acted like it was nothing? You know, no. So it was, it was actually a very tense moment. Um, I didn't want to leave as soon as the doors were open. Um, I also realized that there might be someone, a uh, security guard at the bathroom entrance. Uh, he's been there the whole time. Someone comes walking out. You know, right. maybe he questions his sanity, but maybe he doesn't, you know, right. and says, what's going on? And also a dead giveaway. Um, I didn't have a wristband. Even the crew had wristbands from what I recall. That's right. hundred percent sure that any spectator had a wristband. Um, but I did not. And I was wearing short sleeves. And so that was a dead giveaway. So I, I it was around 15 minutes after doors open. 
I heard commotion outside and it was about 15 minutes after doors opened where I, um, I felt comfortable going out, but not until someone else came into the bathroom. I wanted someone to come in. I leave. Then if two people come out, that guy's saying, wait a second. If he wants to question, if he's really <laughs> on his, you know, game, two people didn't go in, but now I'm already long gone. And now this guy's a legitimate guy. So that was, uh, someone came in, went to go pee. I walked out and, uh, and actually the guy wasn't even there. Uh, he happened to just not be there. And I said, Holy, this universe is aligning for this one today. And, uh, and I was out and now I'm in this venue. The image that is seared into my mind, when leaving that venue was a kid felt maybe 23 years old looking at his friend walks in and his jaw and that I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it it just people were only there if you knew the significance of this concert and everyone did and no phones were allowed. And that, at the beginning of this podcast, you talked about how, you know, either not having your phone or how it was locked up and we all look at our phones too much. And they, they, there wasn't any of that. No phones were allowed. And the focus of everyone was this concert. And um, I walked out and, um, and I was in. And this is around 10, 15. So how long, I guess you were just among the sea of people and you felt like you were cool and, and just, felt, you were waiting like everybody yes. else? I felt cool. I got cocky and I said, okay, I'll go get a drink. You know, I'll go, I'll go up to the bar. Not actually the bar that I started in the first time. There is a bar in the back of where the, the stage is. Um, and so I go up to the, to the bar and I say, you know, get Bud Light or whatever. And she says, here's your wristband. I said, oh, uh, I don't even remember what I said, but I remember just walking away just and she had her job. I, I was confident that, you know, there's people all around trying to get drinks. I don't think she's going to say anything, but that was the closest I came to blowing. And I said, OK, you're not drinking anything uh, for the whole night. You don't have a phone. That is fine. And like. I wasn't looking at, I was there to get drunk, but you know, sure, I'll get a beer and no. So then uh, I just meandered and blended in uh, until they went on, which I believe was, you know, maybe another hour, hour and a half later. So tell me what it was like when they finally went yeah. on. Cause where you were, I remember where I was, which was across the country watching it on my phone. Cause I think they were, <laughs> other people who did manage to sneak their phone in and were periscoping it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if that, is that, if that's still an app, if that's still a thing, Probably. But, but it was going on. I'm just lying on my bed, watching it, you know, until 3 AM, like a, the cool kid that I am. So what you got to tell me, cause you yeah. do have a couple pictures. You do have a couple photos, but that even that was precarious. Yes. Uh, another risky situation for you. Right. So, uh, the first part of that question was, what was it like? And it, it, it really, um, it was just the energy of the show. There was nothing like this. Everyone in that, there was a combination of shock. I can't believe I'm here. Anticipation, jubilation. Um, every, people just knew the significance of being in that location. There was already a commotion outside. Everyone knew what I heard. These tickets were flipping for anywhere from three to four thousand um, dollars. Had I had a ticket, I would like to think that I would not have sold it. I don't know, but I can't you know? No choice here. I don't have a ticket. Um, and then the phone thing. Yeah, it was. It was so funny because I knew I had my phone. And phones weren't allowed, and uh, I knew I had it. <laughs> and I wasn't going to try to screw it up. I was not going to take my phone out for at least a couple songs. I, I, I after that close run in at the bar, I'm like, I'm not pushing my luck. I'm damn well going to get some video when it, I, that time comes and some pictures. But 
you know, not right now. And um, uh, yeah, so I had it, but I didn't take it out right away. Okay. So where, so where were you in the seat of people and how did you yeah. hold it up and you were spotted? I enjoyed that part of the story. <laughs> so I'll tell you, yeah. So um, I'll take it through it. So I am, I, if I, if you have a picture of, I should have looked this up before but if you have a picture of, let's say the crowd, I have seen myself in the crowd and um, you know, I would just call myself, if you if, if the, the stage is 12 noon, say I was like seven o'clock, you okay. know, if, if you're on the stage looking out, I would have been out and to the right. Um, and so, yeah, I come on and I, I, I don't remember what they opened it with. I'd have to see the um, set list. Do you have a set list? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's, it's too easy just from my own memory, okay. but uh, I'll, I'll double check anyway. Yeah, yeah. okay. So I, I see, I got a video of it so easy. So I thought that I had waited a couple songs, but whatever it was, you know, they yeah. come out and... I knew that once they came out, I felt vindicated. I felt I could get, as soon as they went into that first song, I didn't care if I, I really didn't even care. I would have cared if I got kicked out, but I just, I made it. I felt like mission accomplished in that moment. And so, yeah, you know, they're playing you can't a take song. take your memories away. Like you see it. It's Hell right. no, I did it, baby. I'm here. <laughs> I accomplished it. And uh, so now enjoy the concert. It's got to be midnight at this point. They're known for going on late. Um, so I play a couple songs. They played Welcome to the Jungle. Actually, I believe that I took the video of the moment before I knew they were going to play Welcome to the Jungle. And Axel says, you know who you are? <laughs> you know, and so it was just, I caught that moment and uh, I didn't want to, I'm not one of these guys that wants to tape everything I'm at or record it. Um, I have a, um, at sporting events, I have a, a one at bat rule. You could take video from the one at bat, take a picture, but just watch the game. Just watch, it. you know, come on. So I did want to get a couple of videos. I caught beginning of welcome to the jungle, but I put that phone away. I said, hell no, I am uh, not going to miss out on this because I wanted to film it. So I fully Im immersed myself in that song and um, taking a couple pictures afterwards and I feel a tap on the shoulder. Ooh, no. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, this can't be, you know, I, I, I knew this could be it. I knew that this could be it. And I accepted it and I said, all right, I did it. And this guy, taps me on the shoulder. He says, he points up to the balcony. And I look up and it is this security. It gotta be this big buff Hawaiian dude with the hair of Troy Palomalu. And, he, <laughs> and he's like really angry faced and he's pointing at the door. And I said, take me home, you know? <laughs> so I walk out and he's escorting me out and we get outside. So you're outside the venue at this time? Outside of the venue. Um, two steps outside. He says, delete those videos. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's a moron. I could go into recently deleted. I've already sent them to my friends. Okay, fine. You want me to delete the video? Sure, no problem. So I, I took out my phone. I said, here, look what I got. I delete, 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 delete. You know, no problem. And he says, okay. And I realized that he's not kicking me out. And I just walked back in. <laughs> Thank you, whoever you are. Man, that was cool. And I went back in. That phone went right in my pocket. It was on, what, 1% battery anyway at this point. And, uh, you know... We all know I didn't charge. I know, you know I didn't charge my phone before I came in. So okay, and I enjoyed the rest of the concert. And um, and I just I remember looking at Axel run across the stage, and I'm thinking, man, this guy ha this guy is a performer. Um, I remember looking at Slash, who I think is just one of the coolest people. Uh, he's just so cool. Uh, <laughs> and I just I just absorbed it, and um. And I did it. I was there. And I did it. And no one could take that away. No, you, you did it. 
Like, wow, that's again, thank you for sharing that. Reading it was, it took me on a journey, it took a lot of people on a journey, but they hear your expression uh, throughout it and uh, the relief in situations. It's tense. That's a tense situation. But it's it's interesting then because you were, again, they, they took you out. Why did they take you outside of the arena just so he can hear you and you were able to just to walk back in? Well, that's, no, that's so, he, so he took, he saw me filming that, if I didn't make that clear. Um, he saw me taking pictures right. and phones were strictly forbidden. I right. did see those big old phone cases that people had. You had to put your phone in this phone case. And when you left, they would, you know, uh, wave a magic wand over it and you take your phone out. Um, but he, he pointed to the door because I, you know, you can't film here. Get the, get out. Um, that's what I was expecting when he brought me outside, you know? But that's just so funny. Like, why would he, he would just say like, either get out of here or give me your phone. And, and he would put it in that case. It's like, he just forgot about you. You know, I don't think that's he had sounds. those cases. Uh, I, he was just some security guy. You know, I'd imagine they'd be at the front uh, or maybe uh, people had already been done coming in. You know, the show had already started. Maybe they put those cases away. Maybe. Um, but all those, know, but those times of like, you were just almost caught. I mean, thank God they didn't order like Taco Bell as a pre-show meal or something like that. Or I don't know, would it have been worse having a second stall and someone that really had to go to the bathroom next to you? No, I think the second stall would have been better because if, if I'm in the first stall, unless someone is doing the exact same thing in another stall, just wait <laughs> till they come out. You know, then I could really play the, oh, I have stomach problems thing. I, you know, and I could be in there for 10, 15 minutes. And assuming that guy isn't in there for 30 minutes, he'll go out and the next person who has the poop goes in and no one's standing there thinking, no one's going to be in the bathroom for long enough to realize that it's the same guy, you know, I guess right. if you wanted to look down at the converses and it's a common shoe, there's no way that someone would have figured it out if there's two people if there's two stalls, but one, someone's just a top. Oh, I bell. get the logistics of it. I'm just trying to think of to pass your time instead of six hours of boredom, but you could have had six hours of boredom with a terrible smell. So <laughs> it, I'm looking at maybe that's, that's just the way my brain works. <laughs> I would have, I, I would have gladly smelled. I, I honestly, if it was a porta potty, I probably. If you're saying you could you could enter this concert if you sit in a porta potty for six hours, okay, <laughs> okay, um, I would have done it, but uh, yeah, no, I don't even think I went to the bathroom in those oh, six hours. Not I, TMI, I, I, but uh, I, I, that's TMI. I think we're past that at this point. I, who knows? Like, what was the next time you wanted to go into a bathroom? You were probably sick of bathrooms oh, after man. that. What what was the end of the night? When when was it finally over? And the, and the, and the ride home was also uh, quite the challenge for you too. So you were not quite out, out of the woods yet. So the reason why I feel that this is my best story ever, all things um, considered, the experience, you know, the, the sneaking in is great. You know, seeing this this band at this first show that we never would have thought happened is because of the layers. This story just keeps on going <laughs> and I the show's over and it must be right 2 a.m. 2 30 encore's over we leave we go I go retrieve my sandbags but sure enough right where I left them you know oh, you're, you're nice to bring them back <laughs> I, I, did, I did yeah you know I, I I did feel like you know I stole this dude's sandbags uh that's you know funny that's like, oh uh, that's almost as awkward as like you're leaving with sandbags that could you almost could have been caught then why are you, you know what stealing your sandbags dude uh, if someone wants to question me at three in the morning i just didn't see an oh. angle where someone would question me for that's that and, okay, okay yeah i did want to return his sandbags okay. i didn't you know i i i did i, I they're not mine good on you uh, so uh <laughs> if they if they had gotten stolen then I don't care. Then I, you know, then, okay, I'll deal with it. But if they were there, I felt okay. like I needed to take them. Okay. So, okay. you know, so I take all these sandbags, you know, okay. The, uh, the walk of shame, which not even shame, the walk of fame, the walk of, uh, accomplishment. I was gladly walking with these sandbags and I go out, I walk and I'm overloaded. I go out to my car and I could have swore that I parked it right here. No car. My car is gone. I am now fully confident that I parked in this location and there is no car. 
I walk down to the end of the block, tollway zone from these hours. Oh, no. And I said, oh. So now it is three in the morning. I have 50 pounds of sandbags and a phone at one or 2% battery. I have to call an Uber, connect to one, pray that he doesn't cancel, hope he can find me, hope that the location that this sign says to call is accurate. And I connected with the Uber and he showed up. And I'm in this Uber with this other dude. And, you know, I have all these sandbags. What the hell? What do you do? What do you, and well, did, said, anyone, uh, did anyone have a charger, at least, at that point? Did once you? I got in the car, okay. I was able to charge my phone. <laughs> that must have been a victory. Oh, feed the phone. Oh, that, I didn't feel out of the woods yet because of the car. Um, but I did feel like there was light at the end of the tunnel. I was only one step away. Get the car, and I then I'm home free. The getaway. But on the way over to this uh, this towaway thing, I, I recap this this exact story to this guy in the car. These two, the driver and the passenger. He says, "Dude, you gotta post this to Reddit." And I remember thinking, "Yeah, you know, okay, I'm sure people would get a kick out of it." In retrospect, I wish I did. Um, you know, it just. In retrospect, I wish I did. But at the time, you know, I didn't do this for internet fame. I did this for me and to, you know, to bag on my friends and brag to them. So I, I didn't. But uh, I recap the story. He drops me off the towing station. And um, I look, I tell the person, hey, I think my car is here. This is the license plate. And there was a moment where types on the thing. And she's not saying we don't have your car here. And I knew that every second that went by where she did not say we don't have this car, I felt better and better. And at this point, I didn't give up a damn what it cost to get that car back. I didn't have a ton of money at the time, but I mean, that's the whatever I have to pay to see this concert, put it on the expense report. Right. And so, um, the car pulls up, paid like two fifty in cash, which I'm sure went right to someone's pocket. And I could, I've never been happier to pay two hundred fifty dollars for, you know, in my life. And uh, I got in the car, I took a deep breath, and that was it. End scene. Wow. I mean, that's just cr- again, that's just a lot. A lot of thought process that went into this. Things that could have gone wrong. Just the the comedy of you just sitting in a toilet stall for for six hours, bored off my ass, bored, uh, almost getting caught getting a drink, you know, almost getting caught taking pictures. It's just a you know your your car situation, the battery. This is a lot of variables. I mean, I don't it's, know. If, we'll see if Spielberg picks this up. We'll see. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's uh, it's my favorite story. It's uh, it just you can't I. And and period. Well, I appreciate you you sharing it, and and when I did, you know, share because uh, again, not everyone's on Reddit. You know, I know that's like kind of the big place to share stories like this, which is really cool. And thanks to all the listeners who suggested it. And uh, but it's it adds an extra element of life to, to hear it, and it's cool. I think it's cool. It it means more maybe all these years later to tell the story because there are people who. You see it all the time. They go on to like the Lakers court, you know, or, or somewhere they shouldn't be. And it's completely just for the gram or for the TikTok or whatever it is. And it is for the fame. And yeah, yeah, it could be haha kind of funny, but there are situations that go wrong. This is just a silly kind of like a fun. This to me, this just sounds like, I don't know, who is the victim here? Uh, because it, even like the, the fans that were waiting and the lucky fans that were able to get in. There were a lot of just industry bigwigs there and everything like that because yes. it's just it was a moment in time. And so when I posted, there were other people sharing their stories or like, oh, I have a crazy story, too. But you wouldn't believe me. So I hope your story encourages others because I'm sure you're not the only one to break into a Guns N' Roses show. Again, 
Uh, we're talking about Axel slash Duff. They've all done their their share. Uh, the stealing instruments when they were younger. That's what this band is kind of founded on. So I think it's the uh, it's it's cool that you were able to do it successfully. Part of uh, part very small part of the equation is I knew the band would approve of this. Oh man, there's there is one uh, hope that I have, and uh, if Let's I could ever it. tell this story to one of the band members, right? I I would love if one if they just knew it, you know, and um, I just think they would love it. And you know that that that's the only thing that I the only kind of attention that I really would want from that is uh, just one of them. Just just let me know you heard the story, you know, and maybe one <laughs> day they will, and maybe they won't, but you know. I just think it's cool to see the re reaction for most of the Guns N' Roses fans that just like this is again. It sounds like a, a script for Detroit Rock City or something like that, you know. I, I even again because they make uh, movies where you're, you're stuck in a phone booth literally the entire time. You so tell me this isn't movie material. So this is what happens <laughs> with Guns N' Roses. You get fans breaking into uh into shows. You get fans stealing music. Because <laughs> we're waiting. This was never going to happen. They were never going to reunite. They were never going to put out new music. We're still kind of waiting on a lot of these things. So it's these creative Guns N' Roses fans. And again, I don't want uh, encourage anybody to do this, but Corey is a professional. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I said, I see like Mission Impossible. I, I, I have all these. I wish I was a good like editor or an animator. I would I would love to uh to do that. Oh, an animation to this video to to this story would uh that would be tops. Uh, <laughs> it would just add a level of humor and it, it would be very funny. Yeah. I yeah. Right. That. Well, Corey, I, I thank you for coming on. As I mentioned, you're just thanks a, for having me. You're just a dude. Uh, you know, typed on Reddit. And this is the best part of me doing this podcast. Yes, I get to interview really cool people. Uh, the next episode is actually going to feature Tim Ripper Owens, uh, former Judas Priest, and of course, just recently. That's awesome. Yeah, just him, but you know, recently with Scott Ian uh, and, and Sean Bevan and with GNR people having at least the chance once to talk to Fortis and Dizzy Reed. You know, it's it's a uh, it's it's a lot of it is very cool to have those opportunities, but to connect with fans all across the globe. I know you and I might have that little East Coast connection, but. I've had fans on from uh, from Australia to Canada that's to awesome. you know Guatemala share their stories. So this that's what this podcast is here. We all meet here to uh, to connect on Guns N' Roses, no matter what your political affiliation is or whatever it is. Just uh, we love this band, and they sometimes make us do crazy things that we normally Hell yeah. wouldn't do. <laughs> Hell yeah! And you know it was a victimless crime, and. Uh... <laughs> That would be my only piece of advice. If you're gonna sneak into something, make it be a vic make it be victimless. You know, don't break anything. Don't but hey, you know what? If you don't, I will endorse it. <laughs> you know, don't do anything illegal. Don't break any. Don't hurt anyone. But uh, if you can outwit, okay. It's making no, you know. I'm because I'm such a Simpsons guy. I keep thinking of uh, Nelson going. You know, he thinks stealing is a victim of a crime, but he's like, it's like punching somebody in the dark. I don't know about that. That's <laughs> somebody's getting hurt there. Sorry, I have yeah. my Simpsons uh, Tourette's go off. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, enough of that. Corey, thank you so much for your time. If you, I don't know, break into the reunion with Izzy and Steven, if that ever happens, let me know. I will. And before I go, I have one PSA that I would like to, to share with everyone. It's kind of, it's totally off topic. I found out recently that the U.S. can legally wax your produce and usually um, rinsing it under hot water. You know, you should rinse your produce, but you can only really get it all off if you peel your fruit, apples, um, peppers, cucumbers. So my PSA is to peel your uh, produce. And uh, that's all I wanted to, to share on that. Okay, I'll, I'm going to talk to my wife about that. She's really yes. busy that. We we order from Misfits Market. Uh, she's into oh, I love it. Thing. So uh, I'm going to ask her about that. So good yep, apples were the one that caught up, caught me off guard. Yeah. All right. Good PSA. All right. Yes. So yeah, if you're a Guns N' Roses fan with a great story and a PSA, let me know. <laughs> That's all I needed. All right. All right. And so on the next episode, when are you going to see it? Well, in the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, I don't know if as soon as the word, but you'll see it.